I better get right to it because uh, at the end we're going to pray for the few graduates that are here with us today. Bless them. And today we're talking about blessing. Um, Last week I talked about legacy. This week I want to continue, not with the same story, but, but just a continuation of some of the story and talk about that same thing, but what we pass on and what people need. It seems to me, and I've, I've shared this in the past many times, it comes out in things that Brent teaches us, but people long for love. Maybe you're here today. People long for love and acceptance. People long, all of us maybe in some way, I, I mean, I do, I, I long to be seen and known. Um, and we all have maybe issues with that where we're not, where there's been complications in relationships because that's not been a part of it. Um, and I, th- I see it often w- where it needs to come out in the form of a blessing and what we give and pass on to people. And the Bible, throughout the Bible, and in this story in particular, cursing and blessing are a part of that. We've already seen this from God and people. And it's going to continue on. Cursing and blessing, they're both proclamations, declarations that we pass on. They're negative or positive. They're about someone's present and future. And a lot of it, just to simplify it, is about favor or harm, right? It's not about your language. So when I say cursing, I'm not talking about the language you use outside of this room, all right? I've heard some of your language. We're not talking about that today. It's not a guilt and shame thing. You maybe once in a while can, you know, our men's group, what we say there stays there. But so I won't throw anyone under the bus today, but they could throw me under the bus with certain things. (laughs) We're not talking about our language, and yet we are at the same time because it matters and makes a difference. It seems that, this is my reflection, I'd like you just for a second in your mind, and I keep bringing this up. It feels like a broken record, a lot of people do, but it seems that our current culture, especially around social media, just because it's such a big part of what we do and a lot of who we are at times even, has a lot more cursing in it than blessing. I know that people are throwing out great little placards and cliches and nice little things. I'm I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but it seems there's more the cursing of people. And again, not the language, just the negative, right? Or the feedback that people get. Some of you have experienced it. You write something on there that you hold to, that you believe, that you need, that you want, whatever it is. And the, the, just the now downline of agreement, disagreement, and then the, the name, call, it just starts. You've experienced that. You see that. In our story today, and we've already seen an issue in the family between Jacob and Esau, these two brothers. And Esau has given away his birthright. We talked about that last week. And he was a part to play in that. And now the story's going to, he had a part to play because he gave it away over just a moment of desire and wanting food. And he's hungry. And and you can go back and listen to that message. But now it's going to come when dad dies before he dies, he's going to give a blessing. And it's, it's a cultural thing to give it to the elder son. And just a spoiler alert at the story, he's, it's going to be stolen by Jacob again. He's going to do it again. And you see this longing thousands of years ago, and I think, I believe it's still there today. Especially, I, I, I seem to, to talk about it because it's been on, on my heart so much about fathers and sons. And I don't have a son, but I had a father And I've had a lot of people like a father, and we see that today. So this is not to exclude anyone or mothers. And moms, some of them play dual roles. There's so so much there. So I don't want to leave that. But it doesn't change the fact that there is something about a father-son relationship or a father instilling in their kids these, these, these blessings or cursings, and they stick with them forever. Esau longs for something from his father. It's stolen from him by his younger brother, and it breaks Esau's heart. He's destroyed. 
He comes to his father, and I'm giving you some of the story already, but he says, please, father, bless me too. And his dad's like, I, I gave it, and it stands. I, it's such a big deal in that culture of the day. I think we've lost some of that, but it's a big deal. And it says he just breaks down and weeps. This is the guy who gave his birthright away. And now he's longed for something so much, maybe something's changed. Maybe he's progressively gotten a little better. He understands his own awareness of his self and stuff. He understands it more. Just breaks down and weeps. See, we pass on what we receive. And I, I was thinking about this. It's probably something that you can, you can take even further. When we bless someone, it seems that it pulls them out of something. Maybe it's a negative experience. What was said hundreds of times more, but for a moment, that blessing, it pulls them up out of the pit. It brings them and they rise up. Maybe it's even bodily, like they just, chest comes out a little bit, they feel stronger, they feel better. It does something. Pulls them out, propels them forward. But a curse, that cursing, it, it keeps us bound and tied up. And it holds us back. We stay frozen in somewhere. How do I know that? Because I've dealt with that myself from people. And what happens a lot of times is a lot of things that were said to us or done or that mixture of both blessing and cursing, it keeps you bound so much that you live with it forever. Like, you know the, some of the phrases, you're just, you are, and it's, here's where we'll talk about it in a minute, it speaks to your identity. There are some of you in here right now, some of us in here right now, some of you listening online, and some of that are listening later on, and you have been stuck in that pit of what someone said about you for years. It wasn't a blessing, it was a curse, but some of you also understand the blessing piece. I remember what they said to me about Lois Point and how it brought me out and propelled me forward, or I can't get past what they said. I can't forget it. In whatever relationship you had, curses and blessings are part of this big promise that God gave. Now, with Abraham, who we said in our story, passed away last week and left a legacy that just spilled into his kids and spills into us for the future. Part of the original promise from God to Abraham, we read weeks and weeks ago when we started Genesis. It's found in Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Let me go back to the original promise. It's something important. When we give blessings, we want to go back to some original things. We want to go to what God said. We want to instill identity in people. Look what it says. The Lord has said to Abram, Hey, leave your native country, your relatives, your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. I'm going to pull you out. I'm going to take you. I'm going to propel you forward, Abraham. You're going to lead your family this way. It's going to give them, man, and instill in them all the things that I'm speaking of. And he said, I will make you into a great nation. This is, man, he's pulling this guy out, calling him out and moving him forward. I'm going to make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous. And you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. And then he lays it out for us. This is thousands of years later. We talked about this already. He says, all the families on earth will be blessed through you. Wow. That's that original promise. And God goes always back to these original promises to tell us what blessing and cursing and all these things do. This matters. When you go to Genesis then 26, we're talking about 26 and 27 today, we start the story off, I'm going to read, tell, read, tell kind of thing for a few minutes here. And Abraham has died. There's that original promise. And in 26 verses 1 through 6, it says this, a severe famine now struck the land as had happened before in Abraham's time. So whatever we learn from our fathers, whatever we learn from our previous generations, these things happen again. Listen, all the stuff we're going through right now in our culture, in our community, in our world, it's not new. 
The context may be new, but a lot of this stuff has happened before. The things behind the things, they've happened. All of it has. So this has happened before. This happened in Abraham's time. Whatever you learn from him, you're probably going to repeat some of it. So Isaac moved to Gerar, where Abimelech, king of the Philistines, lived. The Lord appeared, that's really key, to Isaac and said, do not go down to Egypt, but do as I tell you. Live here as a foreigner in the land, that I will be with you and bless you. I hereby confirm that I will give all these lands to you and your descendants, just as I solemnly promised in Genesis 12 to your father Abraham, your father. I will cause your descendants to become as numerous as the stars of the sky, and I will give you, give them all these lands. And through your descendants, all of the nations will be blessed. I will do this. Why? I will do this because Abraham, your father, listened to me, and he obeyed all my requirements, commands, decrees, and instructions. So Isaac stayed there. Because he did this, I'm going to do this. Now, during that time, as he lived there, let me just tell you a little bit of the story in 26. He lives there for a while. And he's going to go through some of the same things that his father Abraham went through. So these things were then passed on into him. He watched mom and dad do this. He watched the community do this. And he can get like us when we do that, stuck in old patterns. So for example, the biggest one in the story that we're not going to read, but you can read it later on, is his dad Abraham twice we read told the king, Abimelech, told others that his beautiful wife was his sister. He didn't do it once, he did it twice. And here's what's crazy. Right here in 26, son does the same thing. Has a beautiful wife. Everyone thinks she's hot. They want her. And he says, listen. You know what he does? He says, I'm afraid You tell everybody, and I will, that you're my sister. Well, Abimelech the king finds out, and a man who's not godly is the man of integrity because he says, why did you do this? What? What is wrong with you? And he says in return, hey, listen, I was afraid I wonder if his father taught them that. So, I thought, see, out of fear, we tell ourselves stories, and then it dictates decisions we make. I was afraid, so I thought, you're going to kill me because of that fear, because of her. And luckily, God stopped it, saved the whole situation. But it impacts community. And so he continues to live. He has some of the old patterns of his father. Some of the same conflict happens in community and in his family. He has success and failure in his faith. And it seems, because what was passed on to him is things not dealt with progressively get worse, not better. They shape him. And then he's passing them on to others. Here's the amazing thing. Here's where it goes back to that reckless love. God, I, like it's, it's hard to fathom that in the midst of even failure, God still shows up. I think that's a good perspective for us. Genesis 26, 23 through 25, let me read it to you. God appears again to him, repeats some of the promise. From there, Isaac moved to Beersheba, where the Lord appeared to him on the night of his arrival. He appears again. He shows up again. I am the God of your father Abraham, he said. He repeats the promise. Do not be afraid, for I am with you, and I will bless you. I will multiply your descendants, and they will become a great nation. I will do this because of my promise to Abraham, my servant. 
The promise is repeated. Isaac builds an altar. He worships the Lord. He sets up camp. He digs a well. He does all the things that he's been doing as he's progressively gone along. In the midst of that, here's the big story, and then I'll give you some principles about blessing. Jacob is going to steal his brother's blessing. So some of you might be familiar with the story, but Isaac is old now. He's blind, and he calls for Esau to go out and get him some wild game. He's a hunter, Esau is. We learned this before. And he tells him, hey, listen, son, my oldest son, prepare my favorite dish, bring, bring it to me to eat, then I will pronounce a blessing upon you. Because it belongs to you, my firstborn son. But here's what's crazy. Rebecca hears this. Mom hears this. Mom overhears what Isaac has said to his son Esau. So this is what's interesting. She says it's in the story there. Mom overhears what Isaac had to say to his son Esau. So she said to her son Jacob, right there, there should be a problem. They've got favorites. And it's going to carry on throughout history. She says to him, hey, listen, do exactly what I tell you, all right? Go kill a couple goats out there, all right? Your brother's gone. He's hunting. He's going to make dad a meal, a really great meal. He's going to get blessed, but I want you to get that blessing. So go out there, get two goats. And Jacob says, hey, listen, that's not going to work. Remember, we learned this before. Esau's really hairy. She goes, I got that cover. Don't worry about it. Go kill the goats. Bring it back in. I'll use them. I'm going to prepare your father's favorite dish. Then you're going to take that food to your father, and you're going to get the blessing that's supposed to go to your brother. And he's worried. Jacob says, Mom, th this is not going to work, man. He's going to know. And she goes, I got it covered. He's going he's gonna to see. Man, Dad's going to see that I'm trying to trick him. And then he'll curse me, see here it is again, instead of bless me. Then she says, this is what's shocking, let that curse fall on me, son. Just do what I tell you to do, go out and get the goats for me. So he does. He goes out and gets the goats. She prepares a beautiful meal. She even takes some of the skin, puts it on his neck and arms to make him like he's hairy like his brother. Like this is crazy. Jacob takes this meal, and I was like reading that story again, and it says, and she included freshly baked, because you guys know about this meat because I've shared it before, sourdough bread. Like right there, I'm, I'm in trouble. I could be tricked. He takes it in there, this great meal with all this beautiful bread, all the smells. He takes it in there to his dad. And Isaac's, Isaac says to his son, Jacob, like, how did you do that so quickly? And then here's what's even crazy, because sometimes we blame God for the problems of the past. He says, oh, God helped me. God helped me. He's lying in there. The Lord put it in my path. And he smells all this food, and he smells the goat skin on him, and he says, oh, it's my son, Esau. And he blesses him. Here's the blessing. It's not up there on your notes, but on the screens, but it says, from the dew of heaven and the riches of the earth, may God always give you abundant harvests of grain and bountiful new wine. May many nations become your servants, and may they bow down to you. May you be the master over your brothers, and we're going to see that later on further into the family. And may your mother's sons bow down to you. All who curse you will be cursed, and all who bless you will be blessed. And as soon as he got that blessing, he takes off, and at the same moment, Esau comes in. And Esau has prepared this beautiful meal. He brings it into his dad. And he says, Father, sit up and bless me. Your older son is here. And Isaac says, Who are you? It's your son. I'm your firstborn. And Isaac begins to tremble, dad begins to just shake. He realizes he's been tricked. That who just served me wild game? Who, who brought that to me? And son, I've already eaten it, and I've already given that blessing away, and it is irrevocable. This is what I told you earlier. This is the longing of humanity thousands of years later because es Esau heard his father's words, and he let out a bitter cry. Oh, my father, what about me? Do you have nothing left for me? 
This is the longing of a son for a father to give him a blessing, to be known, to be seen, to be loved, to be accepted. Just the same longing we have for thousands of years. Men and women have wanted that from their parents, from their mentors, from their churches. And Isaac said, your brother was here. He tricked me. He's taken away your blessing. Here's the end of the story. Then I'll give you some thoughts. Esau exclaimed, no wonder his name is Jacob, for he now has cheated me twice. Remember, he took the birthright. Now he takes the blessing. First he took my rights as the firstborn. Now he's stolen my blessing. Oh, haven't you saved even one blessing for me, Isaac said to Esau. I've made Jacob your master, and I've declared that all his brothers will be his servants. I've guaranteed him an abundance of grain and wine. What is left for me to give you, my son? Esau pleaded, but do you have only one blessing, O my father? Bless me too. Then Esau broke down and wept, and finally his father Isaac said to him, you will live away from the richness of the earth. (laughs) This sounds so sad. You will live away from the richness of the earth and away from the dew of heaven above. You will live by your sword, And you will serve your brother. Let me pause there for a minute. This last line, man, I'm going to share in a couple weeks, I think is so awesome. I'm not going to do it now because we don't have a lot of time. But, and then he says, when you decide to break free Esau, you will shake his yoke from your neck. Why do I say that? Because it seems that a lot of people have a yoke of cursing around their neck and it's dictating the way they live their life. And I have no doubt, it's not because God is revealing something, it's because statistics just say in this room right now, there are some people with the yoke, the burden, and brokenness of what was said to you in the past, what was done to you in the past, and it is destroying your life. It is keeping you bound up. And God has given us answers for that. And Esau is broken. He says in there in the end, From that time on, Esau hated Jacob. There it is. I hate him. I hate him. Because their father had given Jacob the blessing. And Esau took it so far, it says he begins to scheme. I will soon be mourning my father's death. And you know what then I'm going to do? I'm going to kill my brother. That is a heavy yoke and burden to carry. And we'll see an answer to that in a few weeks. I hope you come back. All right? Let me give you some thoughts to wrap up the day. Then we're going to sing a song. You can take communion. And I want to bless the graduates that are here. Number one, in your notes, if you want to write this down and then maybe some thoughts with it, is my past influences my present. It does. Like father, like son, this Old Testament soap opera that they're living in is a lot of just passed on, passed on, legacy left. It can be good, but it is often a cursing and bad. Abraham passes on how to deal with, we read it earlier because it happened in his time, famine. How do I deal with life in the midst of famine, in the midst of failure, in the midst of family and conflict and faith? Because sometimes he left and passed on great faith that he had in God and the way he lived in it. And other times, the struggle of faith. One of them even like, hey, did you think he didn't sit down at some point with his son and go, hey, listen. I didn't just do this once. I did it twice. Don't do this. It didn't work out good, man. Hey, son, never make your wife be your sister. That's like good wisdom to pass on, right? That's like, that's good advice. If my past, and we all have it, is not dealt with, Here's what it causes me to do. I already said this in some way many times. It causes me to stay stuck in the present. I remain a victim. And there's legit things that we've been, you know, that's happened to us. But we can't stay there and let it dictate our whole life. What it also does, if my present is not dealt with, it impacts my family, my friends, my community of people. Because there are consequences to the things I do every day the things I say, the way I act, the way I live. We also see it in here that my past influences my present, and if not dealt with, it seems to progressively get worse. 
And we see this in biblical history. We see that in humanity. And what we find it doing is our past often shapes, it shapes me, like my life, and my future. This is why it's so important, what we pass on. Deuteronomy 5, 9 through 10 speaks a little bit about this when it says, you must not bow down to them, these gods. Now, this is the, uh, from Exodus 20 as well. This is the, in the midst of the Ten Commandments. This is God giving Moses and the community. How, this is how you live. This is how you're going to be successful. This is what matters most. This is what you should care about. Don't bow down to other idols that other nations worship and other people. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. This is the tough part. This is the scary part. But hear the whole thing. I lay the sins of the parents, because this horrifies me right now. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected. Is that not true? It is. Even children in the third and fourth generations of those who, this is key, reject me. But here's the beauty of it. I lavish, I love this part, unfailing love, what does he say? For a thousand generations. Third and fourth, nothing compared to a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my commands. My choice in that, I got one. I think I'm going to stick with God there. I don't need my sins to follow me. I want the grace and the reckless love of God that extends through generations. This is a warning. It's not a punishment. I think there's pastors out there sometimes that might present it as a punishment. See, parents, watch it because you're so bad. You just screwed your kids up forever. It's not what this is. Don't leave out the second, the other verse. It's actually beautiful, but it should be a little scary. Got to deal with the past. So in that, here's what happens. I pass on what I receive and experience. All right? This is why it matters. If that's true, generations are going to be impacted, said that, affected. So then I pass on what I receive and experience. Like Abraham's passing on to his kids, and they're going to pass on, and they're going to pass on. We're going to see it come up over and over again. I pass on what I receive and what I experience, and then I give it away. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. Just a chapter later in there. God's still working through. How, here's how to live as community. Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is, is alone. He's it. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength. You must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. This matters. This is what you pass on. And then he says, this is how you pass it on. We see this happening thousands of years later in Israel today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home, when you are on the road, when you are going to bed, and when you are getting up. Tie them to your hands. Wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Why? Because you're passing on the things of God to future generations. This matters. And there's a lot of creative ways to do that. This is why our kids and our youth matter. This is why we want you... I, I, I hope it's a little guilt... I, I say that a little bit, you know, sarcastically. The, in a couple of weeks, we're not doing a kids' event, family event. I mean, there's there's stuff for hundred year olds, right? But the like, uh, some of you are going in the water tank. If you're 80s, you need to get in that water tank, right? Not me, okay? But set an example. <laughs> but this matters. We're not doing an event because Ron likes barbecue, so let's have barbecued food and he wants to, you know, play bingo or whatever. We're doing that because we believe that there are generations behind us and currently with us that need, please understand, to, they need to find Jesus. So if we're going to have creative and fun and 
Where's Waldo? I'm not a, I'm not a Where's Waldo guy, <laughs> but I'll put a red and white shirt on. You know why? Because I want somebody to find Jesus. So why do we ask you to write names down that you're going to bring? Because you're the best invitation we got. And we believe we're going to pass something on. It's one of the ways we do that. We want kids to grow up, have an authentic, lasting relationship with Jesus, to love God, love life, love others. That's why we use orange. The church and parents combine together, red and yellow, to create this color. It's the strategy that we utilize. That's why we need more loving leaders like you to help pass on the things of God into their life, to repeat over and over again, to tie them on their arms, to just bind them up with the things of God and pray and love them. This matters. We want them to know that. It's why when you take communion today, so you got that little communion cup. Once in a while we do it all together, but we offer it to you every week. What is one of the reasons why? Because we think it's something that needs to be passed on. Like I read this this week. If you, if you took communion, you know, we need to explain it sometimes. And there's people that don't understand it fully. I understand that. Paul would write to the church in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three 23 through 26. Hey, for I pass on to you, he says, what I received from the Lord himself. Paul says, I received this from Jesus. And then he talks about in the rest of the verses in chapter communion and how to live and, and all of this. But he says, I pass on what I received from Christ himself. That love and grace. The fact that, you know what, cursing has held you, sin has bound you. When I take communion, one of the verses you could bring up is, man, cursing and and sin, it impacts people. It, it affects my family and those around me, my community. And it goes into third and fourth generations. But you know what communion says, what Jesus has done? That is God lavishing his love upon us for a thousand generations. So when you rip that little, you know, piece of styrofoam and eat it and the juice you drink, it's not really about enjoying what that is. It's about saying thank you. Thank you for lavishing upon me your love forever. I need that so desperately. So the question for me and you, I wonder is why do I continue to do what I do? Why do I repeat some of the same patterns like Paul says in Romans 7 I don't know why I keep doing what I'm doing. I don't understand it. It makes no sense. And he comes to the end and says, thank you for Jesus. But here's the biggest thing that seemed to be present in the lives of Abraham and Isaac and, and Jacob and, and as time continues. Why do I continue to do what I do? And here's how I'll say it. Others have written this. I don't believe in the omni-attributes of God. Now, let me explain that just for a minute. Omni means all. This is that little theological piece. It says this, I don't really believe that God is all-present, which is omnipresence, all-powerful, omnipotence, and all-knowing, omniscient. So it causes me, like we've seen in these guys what was passed on to them, like Abraham, like his son, then like their son, like the grandkids. I don't believe that God is here. That causes me to be afraid. And then it says, I think, right? Like Isaac did, like Jacob does. And then I create a different story. And then I self-protect. And then I, I become self-sufficient. I can do it myself. I don't need God. And ultimately it goes back to, I don't think really He's all-powerful, all-present, all-knowing. Kent Hughes said this, that Isaac did not believe that God was with him. He might have theologically affirmed it if asked, but he did not subjectively hold to it in his heart. And he would say for us, it's one thing to theologically affirm that God is omnipresent, but it is quite another to have it dominate and inform us day in and day out. That is awesome. Like, wow, my decision making, God's present with me. Recognizing God's presence crushes the temptation to compromise. 
God's presence puts our fears to flight. It instills confidence and steel. It protects us and our loved ones. It upholds the name of God. That, that is so true. I wonder if a lot of times I have to evaluate myself. Am I theologically saying that God is with me? But, but am I acting like that on a daily basis? And if so, how does it then dominate and form me day by day? Okay, so what does God do in that? Here's how he's laying it out. He seems to, and he's been doing it for thousands of years, and it culminates really in Jesus, and then he does it through the Holy Spirit now continually. He appears and reappears over and over again. Twice in this story, we see God showing up, repeating the promise that was given to Abraham. Because it seems in your notes that the promises of God reveal his presence and participation in the story. This is why I need God to be present. Believe God is present. I need him to intervene amid this soap opera that I'm living in at times. This is the Genesis 26 that we read twice where God continues to appear, show up, stay. He's involved. He's engaged. He is constantly coming back into the lives of these players in the story and he is revealing through his appearing his omni-attributes. I'm all-powerful. I'm all-knowing. I'm present with you. I believe somewhere a conversation had to happen over a great meal, around an open fire. Abraham sits with Isaac where he saw this happen the most. We read this story weeks ago. Hey, Isaac, do you remember that day? Do you remember the day when God told me that you and I were going to go sacrifice on the mountain? Do you remember you carrying the wood and how heavy it was? Do you remember when we got to the spot and we built an altar? Do you remember when you asked me, hey, Father, where, where's, I mean, I see all the stuff, but where's the offering? Where's the sacrifice? And do you remember what I told you? I said that God will provide because he is present with us and he is more powerful than us. But the temptation is to be self-sufficient because I'm afraid. Do you remember me picking up the knife after I tied you and you willingly went on the altar. Do you remember that we saw at the last moment? Do you remember that we saw in the thicket the ram and that God gave the replacement? Do you remember that? God seems to constantly, I mean, he's done it in my life we don't have time to talk about it, but he's done it in so many ways. I've shared some with you before, how he continues to show up. We talk about Jesus all the time, maybe the greatest. Jesus comes and reveals the omni-attributes of God. He starts in the form of a child. He grows up and he just starts entering into people's lives, appearing and showing up in their lives to show them that God loves you, God cares, he knows you, you're seen. I'm all powerful, so I'll heal. I'm present with you, I will not abandon you. I know things that the woman at the well, I know your story and I'm not leaving. And she was, it was revealed, this beauty of God. His love, acceptance, new identity, transformed lives, revealing God himself. All right, so what do we do? In light of all that, if this is true, what I do matters, what I pass on matters, that God's going to appear and remind me of these things all the time, that he is committed to his promises because he keeps repeating them. I read them constantly. What do I do? There's a couple that are just simple to write in the story and a couple that I want to take just a second longer on. But number one, listen and obey. He tells him right in the beginning, hey, listen, here's the answer. Be like your father. I hope that Abraham passed on. When God speaks, listen and just be obedient to what he's saying, even in your fear. 
I wonder, though, because it said when he did that, there was a famine in the land. I wonder how well I listen in the midst of a famine as opposed to when I'm flourishing. It's easy to listen and obey God when everything's working out great. It's hard when things aren't. Two, live as an active outsider. One of the things that he is told in this story is that we long for home, heaven one day, eternity, but that we got to live right here, right now. That that's part of, remember I said last week, you leave a legacy while you're living. You pass on what you're experiencing. And so we got to participate. And in the story we see, we see uh, the guys putting down roots, they're digging wells, they're staying in that spot till God says move. And then a lot of it is based on my belief in God's work and ways and is he involved or not in all of this. So I live as an outsider but actively inside God's promises and presence. I get tired. So if you say this to me, I'm sorry. I'm going to anger you now. We had a good run. Thanks for coming. I'll see you down the road, all right? But I want to go to heaven. It's way better than down here. But please hear me. We got a lot of work to do down here. And if, if, if I am so caught up in that, I believe Jesus is coming back. I believe what his word says 100%. Don't get me wrong. But it, we, we are living in eternity now. We got work to do here. And when it's our time, we go home and rejoice. But there are people that need to know Jesus, that need to be blessed and come into his kingdom. And I, I believe that. So if you long for heaven and you're ready to, to just call it right now, man, maybe we just want to come alongside you. But we got to be active outsiders. I know I am temporary residents. First Peter talks about that. This is not my home. But while I'm here, let's live. All right. Two more. Invite people into your life that build you up. Who I have around me matters. They influence me. They shape me. They make a difference. And so many places in the Bible speak to that. To our, our I think there's three of the graduates. If there's someone else in here, you're welcome to come up in a minute and, and be blessed and prayed for and, and all that. But when you guys go away, when you go and your parents just rejoice, well, not all, the, I understand, not every, okay. Who you, who you put in your life matters. The circle that you put around you, it, it makes a difference. I remember this sermon so long ago, I don't remember who did it, but it started off, it was about friends. And he talked about, how did you go, like if we go back Ron, how did you go from that to just this hellish chunk of your life? And he, in the sermon, he was talking about this phrase that he said, the story often starts, well, I had this friend. That can go both ways. What if, you, what if before I give you the last thing, what if... This isn't working out for you. Just real quick. What if I was not blessed? What if my father did not give these things to me, my mother, my family? What if I failed so much that I'm living, I feel like I'm living in a curse? It is why I know we are imperfect, but the church is, we're created as a family. Like, I want you to come here and be blessed. I don't feel like all the sermons about that today, but I want you to come here and feel loved seen, known. We want to get better at that. That's why Hebrews 10 says, we've repeated many times, like, don't forsake the gathering together of one another. Why? Because the church needs more money. <laughs> it's not, no. I mean, yes, but no. Right? We gather together ultimately to honor God. And some of us, myself included, we just need encouragement sometimes. Just love, to be seen, to be known. It's just a person. 
Know that if you've fallen, you don't have to stay that way. Galatians 3 talks about this. Jesus broke the curse. We read this earlier. Christ has rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law. When he was hung on the cross, he took upon himself the curse for my wrongdoing. For it is written in the scriptures, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. Through Christ Jesus, God has blessed the Gentiles with the same blessing he promised to Abraham in chapter 12, then again in 26, and on and on, so that we who are believers might receive the promised Holy Spirit through faith. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Worship team can come. <laughs> Our two guys, I guess. <laughs> Act like there's a whole team. All 20 of you can come up now, right? Get the band ready. I love you guys. The last thing is this. It culminates in this. Bless people instead of cursing them. We we need some adjustments in our thinking. Be a person of blessing. Words matter. They make a difference. Blessings imply long-term action, involvement, and commitment. I've been loving Walter Brueggemann through this. Some of you um, have kind of tracked with me on that a little bit. He's a little outside-of-the-box commentator. But he talks about blessing as intergenerational. The parents and children have a deep stake in each other's destinies. This narrative that we just read, it refutes every notion of individualism. The generations, man, he even used this word, terrifyingly bound together. Like, I don't know what it is sometimes. It, it, It makes no sense. We're connected, man. This narrative presumes that symbolic actions have genuine and abiding power. Symbolic actions like laying on of hands, we're going to do that in a minute. They're not empty gestures signifying nothing. They meant something then. I still think they do today. I mean, I, you guys know some of you, I'm a hugger. Once in a while I've made the mistake and not asked you if I can hug you and I just did it, Sorry. Uh, I still remember uh, Tom Savins. It just popped in my brain that I was destroyed as a pastor, it felt like. And I remember walking in the first time when I went to work at Table Rock, and he looked at me, and I th- we had some dialogue about some, some hurt and brokenness that I was battling right then from previous church stuff and pastoring in the church that I had just left, and then the pastor was mad at me, and all this stuff's just going off, and he's just like, do you, you need a hug? I, and I think I just start bawling. I do, man. I just need, I don't need any scriptures. I don't need words. I don't need you to pray for me. Just hug me. I think symbolic actions appropriately, they make a difference. This narrative assumes and affirms spoken words shape human life. And it says in this story that there is power behind that, that it shapes the future not with weapons and arms, but in the use of language and gesture and symbol. Would you stand with me? When I was the youth pastor at Calvary Church in Jacksonville, I read a book by Smalley and Trent called The Gift of Blessing. They've redone it. I've seen it. It's a beautiful book. In just a moment, the graduates, I'm going to have them here and I don't have some powerful words. I don't have like some insight to declare upon you except the grace and goodness of God. But those two guys wrote the gift of the blessing that we see in the life of Jesus. We see in the life of people that's impacted me. And he said that gift, it comes out in these ways, meaningful touch. So maybe this week there's something that you could do to give somebody a meaningful touch. It could be spouse. Really for parents, it's your kids. Right? Spoken words. They, we've just read and, and looked at. They matter. They said, the third thing was, you attach high value to the one being blessed. Like, you matter. You make a difference. You, you, you tell them how important they are. You picture a specific future. And then in all of that, there's an active commitment to fulfill that blessing. I think that's one missing piece. That I can say a lot of words. I can do a lot of things from here. But I wonder how many times I need to be actively committed to the blessing that I've given, right? So I wonder how you can bless someone today. And Father, today, I guess there's two things in here. One, to receive something. That someone may need to receive something. Maybe it's like Jesus and the disciples were 
angered about it when he said, you know, bring the little children to me. These parents wanted their kids to be touched and blessed by Jesus. So someone in here, it's a weird, it's a weird picture that just came to mind. Somebody in here, an adult, just needs to sit with Jesus, sit on the lap of Jesus, be hugged by Jesus, and just hear his words to them that they're loved. How beautiful that would be. And then all of us in some way need to give that away too. And meet each person where they're at right now and may we be people that bless, receive your blessing and bless others in Jesus' name, amen.